Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Detroit Motor City's Architectural Revival, a webinar brought to you by Architectural Adventures. This is a live talk with Stephen Vogel regarding the history of Detroit and the Architectural Adventures itinerary that will be occurring September 25th through the 29th in 2018. Our subject matter expert today who will be presenting this webinar and who will be leading the trip to Detroit in September is Stephen Vogel, FAIA. Stephen Vogel is the Distinguished Professor of Architecture at the School of Architecture at the University of Detroit Mercy, where he served as Dean of Architecture for 18 years. During that time, he focused the school's mission to engage in service to underserved urban communities and to educate future architects committed to building sustainable cities. Professor Vogel, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Hasti. And uh, hello and thank you to everyone who has joined in uh, on the webinar. In the short time we have together today, I will uh, fill you in on some of the uh, hopefully wonderful things uh, that you might see if you decide to uh, come to Detroit. A little more on my background. Um, I'm not from Detroit originally. I came here from a farm in Northwest Indiana when I was 17. I came here to go to uh, architecture school um, where I graduated and decided to stay in this uh, amazing city. And I uh, built a thriving practice in downtown Detroit uh, in the 1970s through the 1990s, which included urban design, um, adaptive reuse, historic preservation, uh, and housing. Um, I became a faculty member at University of Detroit Mercy fairly early, early on, and in 1993 I became uh, Dean of the school, as Hasti uh, mentioned, uh, and I um, t have taught uh, all kinds of courses, but uh, early on I, I taught architectural history and theory uh, as well as design studios, and today I'm teaching seminars on Detroit uh, and on uh, historic preservation. And I am absolutely thrilled to show you uh, my wonderful city where I've lived uh, for the last uh, 50 years or so. Uh, next slide, Hasti. Um, th this is an image of Detroit in 1916, and we're going to be looking uh, at our time here at the past, present, and future of the city. Detroit is 315 years old, which makes it one of the oldest cities in the Midwest. It's uh, 150 years older uh, than Chicago, to give you a reference point. And in 1916, when this uh, picture was taken, Detroit was already the Motor City. Uh, and Henry Ford was pumping out uh, Model T automobiles uh, at the rate of a car a minute on his uh, reinvented uh, assembly line. Eventually, in this period, 50% of all cars in the world uh, were Model Ts made by Ford. And in this image of downtown, you can see some of those Model Ts, uh, but also uh, the electric trolley system, our mass transit system at that time was considered the best uh, in the United States, uh, but it is now gone and we are in the process of rebuilding it as we speak and as you will see uh, on the tour. Detroit was growing so fast at this time that demographers uh, predicted uh, we would pass Chicago in population uh, by 1935, but a little problem occurred in the meantime called the Depression. Uh, and that sort of put an end to uh, everything, if you will. But Detroit did reach uh, 2 million people and we were the fifth largest city in America. For reference today, we are I think the 23rd largest uh, city in America and we have lost a significant amount of population, but we are on the rebound. 
Uh, next slide, Husky. Um, this uh, image, dramatic image of downtown at night, uh, shows the wealth of Detroit in the 1920s when these uh, Art Deco uh, skyscrapers were built. Um, and the, the design at that time of these buildings often followed uh, Art Deco uh, arts and crafts and city beautiful movement uh, tenants. And we have this amazing array of these Art Deco skyscrapers. 95% of all skyscrapers in Detroit were built between 1923 and 1928. Um, and we will hear and see on our tour that that is about to change and the skylight of Detroit is going to change dramatically in the next five years um, as uh, new buildings are that are on the drawing board as our shovels have been put in the ground uh, start. Uh, next slide, Husty. One of the premier public spaces in Detroit that you see in this image, uh, and it's only a few blocks from your hotel, is uh, Campus Martius. It goes back to the French Baroque plan of Detroit developed in 1805, which drew its information uh, from the plan for Washington, D.C. Although the uh, space itself was really a military uh, a marching ground for the French and then British uh, and then American uh, forts uh, that were built in the early history of the city. Campus Marshes was completely restored and with new event spaces for the 2006 Super Bowl. And you can see crowds enjoying the Winter Blast, which is now an annual event. Now in the upper top of this photograph and then the center with these kind of blue green lights uh, on the top of the building is uh, Minoru Yamasaki's first skyscraper and was sort of a trial run for the World Trade Center. Um, this is the Michigan Consolidated Gas Building which was finished in 1963. Uh, it's literally two blocks from your hotel. We are, are not planning on stopping there, but usually you can walk into the lobby before security guards uh, tell you to leave. And you get a, a really good picture of the detailing of Yamasaki and that he brought to the World Trade Center. The next slide is uh, of the Hudson site in Detroit. Uh, in downtown Detroit. Hudson's was Detroit's 2 million square foot department store, which is second in size only to Macy's in New York. But as Detroit declined, uh, the Hudson's department store was closed as they were building suburban uh, shopping malls with Hudson's. Um, and the building was eventually torn down in the 1980s, which left a hole in the core of downtown. Bedrock, the development arm of uh, Dan Gilbert of um, uh, Quicken Loans uh, fame, um, is a building. In fact, uh, they have broken ground in this project you see right here. Uh, and it will become the tallest uh, building in the city of Detroit and is a mixed use development designed by shop with the firm of Hamilton Anderson uh, in, in Detroit. Um, and, and this is one of these many buildings uh, that are on the drawing boards are ready to uh, break ground in the city as I have mentioned. Next slide, Hasty. Um, the first the first day when you arrive, uh, we will go on a, a bus tour of downtown and the first stop will be into this lobby of the Guardian building, uh, built in the 1920s, like most of these other buildings I've been showing you. And uh, this is really uh, 
In fact, this is my favorite space uh, in the city of Detroit. It's an iconic 1920s Art Deco landmark and a showcase for our famous pottery in Detroit called Puabi Pottery. Uh, you can see the Puabi tiles in the vaults um, in uh, this lobby. Uh, for those of you who might collect pottery, uh, hopefully you can find some time to go shopping at um, Puabi, which has been around since 1908. Uh, or maybe on Saturday after Eastern Market, if your plane is leaving later, you would have a chance to stop by there. Um, also on day one, um, we are going to go by the Detroit Opera House. Uh, Hasti, you can change the slide. Uh, you can see the interior of that Opera House. Um, it was uh, built um, uh, in the late 1920s. We will have a short tour of this building. It was built as a movie palace originally, uh, but it was completely uh, restored in 1996 after a long period of time of vacancy. I had the privilege of being the principal in charge of the restoration of the interiors. And my project architect, Sandy Locks, will join us on this tour and describe how this ceiling in this uh, opera house was restored because it had totally collapsed uh, during its time of vacancy and due to water coming from leaking roofs. At 2,700 seats, uh, it actually, as a movie palace, was 3,400 seats. Um, it is one of the largest opera houses in the world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, on the, the same afternoon you arrive, uh, we were going to uh, go to Mies van der Rohe's Lafayette Park, which uh, borders uh, downtown. And a colleague of mine will um, give a short talk on the history of this uh, development. And then will allow us to go into her townhouse. You see some two-story townhouses uh, here. This development includes high rises and one-story courtyard houses as well. Uh, and in my humble opinion, uh, having traveled all over the world, this is the best example in the world of Mies van der Rohe's uh, multifamily um, housing projects. And it's definitely uh, worth a stop on our tour. Next slide, Husty. Um, on day two, um, we will leave downtown and we will travel to the School of Architecture uh, on the north side of the city, where I will give you uh, uh, essentially a lecture of the entire history of Detroit and some ideas of where the future of Detroit is going. Um, and this will allow us to put everything we see in, in a historical context so you can get a picture of where the city has been and what might happen in the future of the city. A few uh, minutes from the university is this house by Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright did four houses in the Detroit area, but this is the only one that's actually in the city. And it's one of the last buildings that uh, Wright did. Uh, and it was finished in 1956. Wright, uh, never actually saw it finished. He did come to Detroit uh, during construction. Uh, we will meet with the owners of this house, a couple of amazing guys who uh, completely restored it for an unbelievable amount of money about seven years ago. And they will have a graciously allowed us to have a box lunch uh, in the house or weather permitting, which in September it usually does we can have that box lunch in a beautiful garden uh, that they have uh, created. Uh, this style of rights is called mechanic Usonian. Only eight of them were done in his career. So for Frank Lloyd Wright fans on this group, uh, this is a pretty unique experience. Next slide, Hasti. <laughs> Uh, not far from there is the uh, Burwood Wall. Uh, we will travel through uh, a couple of 
really wonderful, beautiful uh, neighborhoods. Uh, but then we will also go into uh, a neighborhood uh, that is kind of emblematic of Detroit's decline. And we will drive by this wall. This wall um, was built uh, by a developer contractor uh, in the 1940s. It's six feet high and three blocks long. And FHA required the developer to build this wall in order for them to give uh, mortgage insurance uh, to his project. And it separates a black community from a white community um, in the 1940s. And this is one really vivid example of segregation uh, in the city of Detroit. FHA also required one other city to build a wall like this. Uh, it was a city in Texas done around the same time. I forget the name of the city. Um, then we will, after this, we will visit the new home of our School of Architecture's nationally known um, Community Design Center, where you will hear from the director of that design center, uh, someone from the planning department, hopefully the director, and some community folks of uh, the struggle and the good things uh, going on in Detroit. This slide uh, shows one of the highlights of the following morning where um, we will uh, visit Cranbrook Academy of Art designed by the famous Finnish architect, Helio Cernan. Uh, you might call Cranbrook, if you're not familiar with it, America's uh, Bauhaus. It's an amazing place. It's about uh, 40 minutes from downtown Detroit. And it was built on a farm owned by George Booth who was the wealthy publisher of the Detroit News and a passionate follower of the arts and crafts movement. We will tour uh, with the Dean of Academics for the uh, Art Academy uh, and others. We will tour the uh, iconic historic buildings uh, and in particular, Sarenin's own house, which is an amazing place to visit and it's not always open uh, to the public. Um, but we will also see uh, several new buildings by the likes of Todd Williams, who by the way graduated as a young boy from uh, Cranbrook grade school and high school and Billy Chen, his partner, Stephen Hall, Raphael Maneo and others who, Dan Hoffman, who have done work, um, newer work on the campus. Um, we are going to have lunch uh, at Cranbrook in the Saarinen Spectacular Boys High School Dining Hall, one of many, many amazing spaces uh, at the school. We will have lunch with uh, students, university students stu uh, and professors. Um, and I think just being in that space to have lunch uh, will be wonderful. I'm, I can't, uh, I've only had the food there a few times, so I can't say much about it. Uh, not surprisingly, Cranbrook is a national historic landmark uh, complex. Next slide, Austin. That same afternoon, this is going to be a full day, that same afternoon, uh, we will stop on the way back downtown in Warren, Michigan, to see the General Motors Technical Center by Elio's son, Errol. Uh, Errol Saarinen and Elio Saarinen both, uh, well, they had a firm, Saarinen and Saarinen, uh, in the suburb of Detroit. And then when Elio died, uh, actually the tech center was being planned at the time, uh, Errol Saarinen uh, took over uh, and his own firm uh, finished the center. This uh, campus has also achieved national landmark status. Uh, we will have an exclusive tour. This place is very hard to get into. I've only uh, been into it twice in my entire 50 years uh, in the city. Um, and it's described as the Versailles of industry. It's a tour de force of modernism 
that was built in uh, 1949. Uh, this tour, by the way, will be given by Susan Skarsgård, the design manager of the General Motors Archive uh, and Special Collections. Because of concert security issues, uh, we will only, uh, at least for sure, be able to visit some more public spaces, which are special spaces in themselves. But hopefully, depending on the day and the, and the time, we might get lucky and be able to go into uh, the design building, for example, where they design cars. Uh, that is very much up in the air and can change literally uh, at the last minute. Uh, the complex recently, in the last uh, four or five years, uh, has undergone a $1 billion renovation uh, with some additions. Uh, that work is just now uh, being finished. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, the morning of the next day will be spent downtown uh, with the Vice President of Urban Design for uh, Gilbert's uh, Bedrock. Uh, and she will go over uh, projects that they have underway or have built. Bedrock now owns 100 buildings in downtown Detroit and owns over 50% of all square footage in downtown. It's a staggering number, which amazes me. And I, as far as I know, it's unprecedented in any city in the United States. It's a little scary that one person uh, uh, owns that much, but you will hear firsthand uh, about what Gilbert is trying to do in Detroit. And by the way, he's started to do work in Cleveland as well. That same afternoon will be spent with Preservation Detroit, our most significant local preservation organization. And we will visit more iconic buildings such as uh, Yamasaki's McGregor Conference Center, which you see here, and Albert Kahn's uh, Fisher building, a, uh, another 1920s uh, masterpiece. Uh, next slide, Hasti. Uh, with Preservation Detroit, we will also visit another 1920s movie palace. Detroit has an amazing number of theater seats. Uh, second, I think, only to New York City, and that's and this is the restored uh, Fox Theater, which in the 1960s was a venue for Motown concerts, and this theater has almost 6,000 seats. The Illich family, which owns the Fox, um, uh, also owns the adjoining brand new Little Caesars Arena, housing the Red Wings and the Pistons, and Comerica Park, home of the Tigers. The Trout Detroit is now the only city in America with four of the four uh, pro sports teams with stadia uh, all within a couple blocks of each other uh, in the downtown. Next slide. And then finally, um, on Saturday, we will uh, end the tour uh, at Eastern Market, the oldest and largest continuously operating farmer's market in the United States. It's about 130 years old. Um, we will meet with the head of Eastern Market and hear how food production has become uh, so vital to Detroit. This will occur on uh, a Saturday where uh, crowds can approach 100,000 people from the whole region, suburbanites and Detroiters alike. Uh, probably in September, it won't be quite that many, maybe 30, 40,000 will be coming on a Saturday morning. Uh, this is truly an iconic place uh, in the city. And it's fitting that this would end your visit in Detroit. I hope some of you could possibly stay longer for a few days, but I'm only showing you the very tip of the iceberg. If you were coming for two weeks, I could show you even more uh, architectural wonders. But I'm going to turn this back to Hasti, uh, and I, I guess there's a few minutes we could take some questions if you want. That's up to Hasti. Thank you. Professor Vogel, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare the presentation today. Um, I hope that our attendees enjoyed the preview uh, and the history and um, 
learned a lot from today's webinar and get, get excited for the actual trip that will be occurring in September. We're going to close today with just a few slides on our Architectural Adventures, um, which is the official travel program of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, our itineraries are expert-led immersive small group tours, and we work with the best uh, tour guides and travel experts who will provide you the educational guidance um, for some of the world's best architecture. It also gives you an opportunity to explore the world's architecture with like-minded individuals. You'll have small group work, educational guidance, and commentary from pre-selected architectural experts, and you'll have the opportunity to participate in special excursion and gain exclusive behind-the-scenes access to popular sites as well as lesser-known architecture. The itinerary for the Detroit trip that's occurring on September 25th through 29th is uh, listed on your slide. This uh, trip is $2,995 per person based on double, double occupancy, and there's a $625 single supplement. This trip is also eligible for 16 AIA learning units for AIA members. It's not necessary that you be a member, but if you are an AIA member, you can uh, have continuing education credits um, by attending this trip based on the educational content. The accommodations for the Detroit trip is Foundation Hotel. This is where you'll be staying for the duration of the trip. And Foundation Hotel actually used to be the old main fire station of Detroit. So they converted the central fire station into this beautiful hotel. I've listed here the trip schedule for 2018 for Architectural Adventures. You can see that we have um, a wide variety of trips that are on the schedule. So um, you are able to look at our website to learn about this or any other Architectural Adventures trips by going to architecturaladventures.org. If you have any questions about the Detroit itinerary, please feel free to contact Architectural Adventures at 1-800-293-5725. And you can also email us at travel at architecturaladventures.org. So with that, I'm going to leave the 2018 trip schedule there um, for you. And if there are any questions, please feel free to enter in the chat or question uh, pod on the right-hand side. We'll give a minute for any questions to come through. Um, I will be also emailing you the PowerPoint along with the uh, recording of today's session, as well as the catalog for the Detroit trip. So you will have that shortly. Okay, it looks like there have been no questions to come in. So with that, I want to again thank Professor Vogel for his time today and his remarks. And thank you all for attending. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you and have a great afternoon.